Welcome to Folkways, an auditory stroll through the rich and fascinating folklore of Britain and Ireland. The beliefs and culture of people who made this cluster of northerly islands their home. From music to psychogeography to what to do if you notice the devil following you to church. It's a long, strange trip and there are no guarantees you'll be home in time for dinner. Hello and welcome to our third episode where I'm delighted to be talking to Rob Jones of Black Dog Zine. This is a frankly gorgeous new publication looking at East Anglian landscape and law. Amongst other things, we're chatting about cities that fell in the sea, black dogs, white dogs and green children. Enjoy. If you're not from around here or you're not as familiar with East Anglia, please don't think that this isn't for you. As well as exploring overall themes such as last episode's look at Midsummer, Folkways will also be diving into some of the real specifics of different places. I hope that this might highlight parallels perhaps with other places that you know. You might think of overlaps or equivalents to the ideas and stories that we discuss. Local manifestations, I guess, of more universal themes. But as well as this, also conversely celebrating what actually makes each place different and therefore worth taking that trip to come explore in the first place. Like a kind of auditory tourist brochure, but for landscape lovers and legend trippers. So wherever you're listening from, let's start this by meeting in London at Liverpool Street Station, where we'll be going over an hour's northeast. You'll need to purchase a somewhat overpriced ticket for the next train to Norwich, where we'll be stopping off at different places along the line. Why not bring your bike too? You'll have to be quick though, it's leaving in 10 minutes. This land is ancient, this land is ours. Cometh the cry from the clueless and rotten, these ponderous words dismissed and forgotten. Not many still revere this most ancient memory, but so it endures through season and century. Soon dread dark descends, and with it the black dog shadowy spectre of tooth and claw, a revenant prowling since times before. Twixt this world and that, a darkling alliance, a growl, a snarl, a scream, then silence. Look over your shoulder when you walk in the dark. Shutter your chambers and rise with the lark. Keep close around you thy daughter and son, lest they stray to the wild and ne'er return. Keep your wit sharp, your prayer book at hand, for the hound that is known throughout this old land will fall to no man, no quarrel or spear, may pierce this great beast, this portent of fear. This is no jest, nor fool's winter tale. This curse do you heed, or soon will ye fail. Remember the black shuck in fear and regret. Do not lose sight, look away, or forget. This land is ancient, this land is theirs. theirs. So I'm very pleased to be talking to Rob Jones today. He's one of the three founders of the new Black Dog Zine. If you're not familiar, before we start, I'd encourage you to head to blackdogzine.co.uk. Here you can also bag yourself a copy. And on their website, they describe themselves as a trio of Suffolk country bumpkins who harbour an interest in the weird history of where they live. Sounds great. The black dog scene they continue is a manifestation of these curiosities, where they share writing and images to delight those who are similarly intrigued. So first off, hi to Rob and thanks so much for joining us today. Pleasure. So Rob, well, perhaps first off, you could just give us a bit of the backstory to the zine and how the hell all this got started. Well, really, really, it was it was Tom 
uh, it was his baby, really, to start with. He, we, we all went off to university at the same time, or at least Tom and I did. Um, and then we sort of missed being in Suffolk, as you would. We were big fans of it. I mean, I, I like walking around. He likes cycling around. Ben, the other guy involved, is also incredibly fond of the area. So when we all came back from university, Tom had just got into um, traditional bookbinding as a hobby we we were all into like fiddler's green and weird walks and like alkahest and the kind of witchier stuff from mainly from a like an aesthetic perspective so yeah as uh tom kind of pitched the idea to ben and i and um yeah we started making started making it um and yeah the reception's been incredible people have been really supportive of it so that's basically the story. We thought there was a big story to be told and getting local creators involved was quite important. So I'm actually holding the zine now and as I flick through here, it's it's really striking. I've got to say it's got quite a specific aesthetic. In particular, um, I've just found this one image of a combine harvester which has been saturated, um, just holding it up to the camera, with this blood red tint. So perhaps you could tell us how the zine got to look the way that it does. Yeah, um, I mean, Tom Wesley. Tom Wesley is the reason it looks the way it does. He's a fairly, very well-talented um, graphic designer and photographer. So basically, he, he's in the years preceding the publication of the zine, um, he spent a lot of time, all the time, in fact, cycling around and taking photos of... Um, East Anglia in general, mainly landscapey stuff, but not always. Um, and yeah, he, uh, you know, whether or not it's intentional, uh, they always tend to have all of his photos, I think, have a fairly coherent identity in that you can, there's a, a sense of whimsy, a bit like, um, there's always a bit of play to them, uh, which can be interpreted in uh, many different ways using different editing techniques. Um, and yeah, I think the fact that it was this, this issue was the land ritual. It was about old earth stories of ages past and, you know, memory and, um, and that kind of thing. The stuff that sort of draws you back to thinking about death and life and a cycle of things, etc. Um, yeah, I think a sort of spooky um aesthetic just came about naturally really i mean it was you know just one of those one of those things and then creating that coherent um or furthering that coherent aesthetic identity throughout the throughout the pieces i think he's done extremely well yeah it's it's mainly been tom's style um visually immersive kind of um yeah folklore i would i would guess yeah and as I'm leafing through, Rob, I'm just thinking about your influences. I'm just wondering if there are any artists or other publications that have had a really direct impact on what you do. Yeah. Um, Penny Bedresa. Harry Corey Wright. Um, yeah, he's uh, he's big on the Instagram and everywhere. Um, but he's, yeah, a pretty incredible photographer. And yeah, I mean, in terms of TV, have you watched Detectorists? It's a Mackenzie Crook series. It explores the metal detectorists um, subculture, which again is enormous in Suffolk. Uh, in in it's specifically it's specific to East Anglia. Um, and it's got Mackenzie Crook in it, and it's very very good. Um, portrays Suffolk in a very so we East Anglia in general, I think, has a very like quite storied history of different subcultural groups within this quite incumbent, conservative. Nothing's going to change around here. Being the same since my time and my father's father, and all of that kind of thing. Mm. Um, but uh, you know, there's always been this undercurrent of um, youth culture and alternative culture which I think is just incredibly interesting. I mean, for it, from the music perspective, there's so much, like, you know, so much incredible stuff. Um, uh, you know, there's sort of whatever genre of music you can possibly think of, uh, It's there's been a foothold in, in Suffolk, even down to um, 
you know really fringe stuff like noise music and and harsh electronics and and ambient excursion music and free improvisation even that there's a huge thing of that in since the 70s in in suffolk um i recently in fact yesterday bought a record by a guy called terry burrows um who makes just the most whacked out music you've ever heard um it was on hamster records but there was a record label called unlikely records which is suffolk based based in ipswich and just has produced some of the craziest music i've ever heard in my life and even up to the present day not quite now because of covid and all that um there's amazing music taking place all the time mm-hmm. experimental music you know bands coming out of places like berry colchester and um, norwich you know all sorts of places hopton st mary for some reason has quite a big scene i know why <laughs> hmm, who'd have thought well you heard it here first guys hopton st mary now i do have to ask and to be honest i might know the answer to this already but um why did you choose the name black dog zine well um you may be familiar with the legend of the black shark uh it's an appropriately local name uh the black dog of bungie very interesting story um you know uh, the great black dog that stalking in the night, protector of the hedge row. Um, and we thought, do you know what? It's a cool name, regardless. Um, and it's really local. It's got that kind of folklore, historical aspect to it. Mm. And um, I have to come clean and tell you, I'm particularly interested in the name Black Dog Zine because... Um, I used to be really obsessed with the Black Dog legend um, when I was a teenager. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. And a book I found that I think really kick-started my imagination was Martin Newell's book of verse, Black Shuck, The Ghost Dog of Eastern England. Yep, it's every bit as good as it sounds. I just love the image of this hound from hell with these saucer red eyes uh, stalking the verges in the twilight. It's, it's interesting because some people don't think it's a hound from hell at all, do they? Some people think it's a manifestation of, of Mother Nature. Um, I had a friend who, um, he had a bit of a, a stressful day, um, decided to go and sleep on the beach, as you would if you lived near a beach, maybe. Nice day. Um, and it was predictably terrible. The wind was awful and he couldn't get to sleep. And he sort of thought it was too dark for me to walk home. So I'm just going to sit here until it's light. And lo and behold, he sees a gigantic dog, you know, walking down the beach alone, huge dog, you know, like man sized. And, um, so that's the most recent sighting of the black dog that I've seen, uh, or I've heard of that was in March last year. But I don't know if you're familiar with the work uh, on HiddenEastAnglia.com. Hidden EA? Absolutely incredible archive, uh, piece of archiving work um, and historical analysis by... uh, The name escapes me. He made this thing called Shuckland, which is a comprehensive, or at least more comprehensive than any other sort of database that I know of, um based on the black shark and sightings of and he's got you know separate uh sections for dubious sightings and strange people who he knows who found the the dog and seen it and there's actually a white dog did you know in henham uh near where they host latitude festival um they henham and there's another place closer to beckles i think um, and they have a white dog rather than a black dog, but it's posited that that was just someone's dog that escaped. There's people who go out on trails walking to try and find the black dog. There's a there's a grave. There's an unmarked. Well, it's marked. There's marked now. It's a gypsy grave. Um, from the early nineteenth century, near Thurston. I think it's somewhere near Thurston. There's a grave. Um, of a gypsy child died in tragic circumstances um but apparently he comes back to play the th- i mean it doesn't say this anywhere but we spoke to an old woman at the time and she told us uh, this sort of 
extra story. How about this um this gypsy kid comes back to life uh every so often and plays a fiddle to a sleeping black dog, a huge sleeping black dog, and these ghostly figures appear on the moor every now and then. Um so yeah, it's it's a it's a fantastically rich t- tale, isn't it? Have you seen that the strange and terrible beast? You know the original libel. I'm guessing the uh, 18th century, based on the printing. I mean, it's an age-old argument when these kind of combined sightings happen that there's like a the whole cynicism of it could all be just people jumping on the bandwagon in order to create this mystique. But, I mean, it's nice to imagine that there is a giant evil... Well, not evil. A giant neutral (laughs) dog walking around around Suffolk at night or walking around East Anglia at night. Um, Yeah, it's it's, it's food for the imagination, isn't it? It certainly is. And talking food for the imagination there, I was just wondering, do you have any other stories or pieces of folklore you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, I mean, there's some famous ones. There's some there's some really famous ones, like the Green Children of Woolpit. Multitude of different interpretations of that, including an amazing film called Cuckoo. Um, and yeah, so there's that. Uh, and I again, I know someone who claims to have seen in the 1970s, it's one of my friend's fathers, um, the green children of Woolpit emerge from a pit of slime. Um, again, whether it's true or not is very much in doubt. But you know, it's interesting. Uh, so I like, I like the fact that you can go to any town, and you can pick up on local uh, folklore there. For example, that gypsy grave thing I was telling you about earlier. Um, That was just a piece of information that was readily disseminated to us by a local, which was really nice. And um, so a a particular favourite of of mine and at the Zine Hours is Dunwich. The the city of Dunwich becoming a tiny village, which is just a pub now. It's basically just a pub, maybe 20 houses, 20 really nice houses, that is. Um, And... um, and that's it, and a ruin, and that's it. Whereas it used to be one of the most thriving places in the world. It's unbelievable. Um, so there's that. There's also um, countless things about Bury. I mean, I'm from Bury St Edmunds, so I'm kind of biased. But you know, you can you can talk about witchcraft and witch hunts um, as much as you like. You know, Matthew Hopkins was from round here, conducted all these witchcraft, the witch hunts. The last known witch hunt actually in the UK. Um, that someone was prosecuted for, I believe, took place in Bungie uh, in the mid-20th century. I think it was like the late 40s, uh, post-war witch hunt. Yeah. And there's uh, Bury in the uh, 19th century has very interesting folklore. There's um, recalled a story about uh, one Arundel Coke who was stabbed brutally in a graveyard. Um, and is bludgeoned by his brother-in-law, and then his head came off, unfortunately. Unlucky break. Um, And then he turned up at his brother-in-law's engagement party um, with no head, holding his head in his hands, full of holes, uh, and basically just ruined everything for him, cursed him. Um, Yeah, this, and, you know, even all the way up to... All the way up to the modern day, there's there's people who are interested in folklore and new folk tales that are being created as we speak. I hope, um, you know, people are people are talking more and more about what has gone on before, partly because of this revival in in folk horror, particularly in cinema. I mean, I think people are more more comfortable with talking about these topics now because of films like. Um, the witch, for example, and the and then after that, the lighthouse as well has got a kind of um, crazy, like folky vibe to it, which people I just think people are really interested now, uh, which is fantastic news. Everyone's up for talking a bit of history. It's nice to have ownership of your own story as well, the the place where you live. To know more about where you come from is to to have something 
that when you meet new people, they will have no idea about probably. Um, and yeah, it's a nice little security, nice little thing to have in your under your belt, nice thing to keep you warm at night. Yeah, and um, the green children of Woolpit that you mentioned is one I've heard a lot uh, in this area. And just thinking about um, the character of East Anglia in some way, I know, of course, like anywhere, um, its rural and urban landscapes are worlds apart. But I was just wondering, just off the top of your head, if you had any particular words that sprung to mind when you think about this corner of the country. Uh, I mean, good question, because it is, as I said before, it's an incredibly diverse place. There's a lot of different things going on. Um, but I think the overall theme is it's very old and you can you can feel the the influence of past generations. I mean, going back to the 13th century, even in, in architecture, let alone the fields and the landscapes themselves, which were designed by human hands thereabouts. I mean, um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a place where you can really feel connected to what went before. I think that plays into it. But there's there's also, um, I think, a real emphasis on creative talent being used in slightly subversive, folky ways. I, d- I think people are quite willing to round here, and I get the same kind of feeling from going to places like Glastonbury, for example, people are quite willing to mm, to step out of the box and be a bit, you know, not be afraid of being judged for being a certain way, which is unusual because it is such an affluent area, you know, it's very much set in its ways um, and and people can be quite, um, quite judgmental. But really, the, where I live, it seems that people are very willing to do, even on a really like micro scale. Um, like I walked through the woods. I live some. There's some woods near where I live. I walked up there the other day, and someone's just built a little fairy village in the in the crook of a tree, right at the bottom of the tree. And you could you could easily walk past it and not notice it. Um, but it's just that kind of little things that bring people in connection with nature. Um, and I th- I think that's important. You know, I was in Norwich yesterday, and I was, spoke to a guy in a park. Um, and he, you know, without any prompting from me, started talking about the ancient ways of, uh, of, well, of Norfolk in, in specifically, but, um, started talking about the, uh, the journey of St. Edmund up to, to Hoxton and to, and to, uh, Hunt Stanton. Um, I learned a couple of things from that man. Very nice. And and people have this strange knowledge that it's very niche and you wouldn't expect them to hold. Um, but, you know, there's a sizable portion of people in the surrounding area who are very, very interested in, in keeping that way of thinking alive, which I'm very grateful for. Your first issue is called Land Ritual, which I love, by the way. And on one of the opening pages, you write, We are moulded by the land we live in. It nourishes us, shapes the way we see the wider world. It is instrumental in forming the people we become. So it'd be great to hear the effect the landscape of where you live has had on you. I mean, I think I would call it probably the single most influential part of growing up where I have grown up. Uh, I've grown up in a very agricultural area, very... Uh, well, not 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 distinctly rural, not rural to the point of no return, but like um, you know, it's it, I'm out. I'm, I don't hear cars driving past, for example. Um, right on cue, a car has just driven past. <laughs> Unbelievable! <laughs> Can't believe it. <laughs> Terrible. Look out of my window, and I see a gigantic field of barley, and 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 massive clear blue skies and buzzards and that kind of thing and and wildlife flora and fauna obviously make up the landscape i i do a lot of walking around um and i just think it, it i think so much as it's impacted me it's made it's given me an appreciation for the for the land uh for having access to the land uh i know a lot of people uh, everywhere in the world might not have access to such an idyllic countryside as i do and therefore, I think it's very important to take full advantage while you can of of that, because God knows, you know, I might, you know, there are developments on my roads, you know, last year, and they might 
continue and we, I might end up living in a sprawling urban metropolis with a one bedroom flat and no windows. But yeah, I mean, Tom, you know, all of us sort of think about the where where we live all the time. I mean, we, we Tom and I were discussing the other day are some of our earliest memories are of uh, uh, there was this wall over the school field and the school field was very much like kind of, you know, you've got asphalt and tarmac and, and all of that kind of thing. But if you could just climb up the wall, which is a gargantuan feat at that age, you you could lift your head over and you could just see this pristine meadow with sheep and hares running around. And, you know, it's just it, having access to that is very important. Um, psychogeography and, and specifically, I mean, I think this place is a really interesting place to go walking because there are so many routes ancient routes that you can take um that exist have existed for thousands of years i mean my friend and i walked um most of the way up st michael's lay uh ley line the other day or the other week and um yeah that was brilliant sort of connecting the dots as it were with your um with your history Hmm. I've got to say the journey up St Michael's Lay sounds fascinating. I'll have to um, pick your brains when we finish this. Something else I just wanted to ask you. Often when I'm out and about in the more rural parts uh, of East Anglia, I often sense the presence of Mr James lingering quite heavily. I'm trying to think how to describe this. Um, a certain eerie, enigmatic quality, I suppose. And some of the establishments that you might go in, I won't name any, of course. Um, there are times when I feel like I could easily have slipped into one of the amazing M.R. James adaptations that were filmed around here. So just thinking about um, books and movies there, are there any other pieces of art um, in any form that, like the work of James, you feel have captured the area in some notable way? I mean, in art, I think the, the best way to look at it is to go... Um, to look at folk artists authors uh, there are many um, for example sh uh, on the theme of like this kind of strange uh, slightly ethereal mystical fey vibe that you can get from certain places in in East Anglia especially in the rural parts if you, don't go to Ruffham strange place well, actually, do go, but like, I, it's like exactly the feeling that you're that you're describing. Anyway, um, Shirley Toulson uh, was a historian and author who lived in Bury St Edmunds for many years. She ran a meditation class in the cathedral um, and a rhythmic chanting class. It was a very interesting woman, uh, and she wrote this book, "Walking the Ancient Lines of East Anglia." And that, her musings while walking just through random bits of the, the East Anglian countryside, all cobbled together and put into like a scrapbook style, um, uh, you know, amalgamation with maps, hand-drawn maps and all of that kind of thing. That kind of thing really appeals to me and real really um, captures the spirit of, of East Anglia. But that's just because I'm really fond of walking. I know many artists around here who are releasing music, creating art, doing illustration. Um that yeah, they're um they're amazing and they're they're the people who are creating this this um this culture and furthering their uh the artistic spirit of East Anglia. Yeah, absolutely. Or while there are obviously many very popular and famous works of art based around it. Um, you know, Constable, for example, John Constable, um, you know, Constable Country, it's named after him. I've got a couple of other points um, I've noted down here that I want to make sure I ask you because my mind is already going off in so many different directions. But I did want to ask you, I think it was the issue before of Weird Walk, um, talking of Dedham Vale just there, uh, where Justin Hopper was talking about Dedham and that it's not quite the untouched rural Adele we might think um, that it's been cultivated quite consciously to look the way it does so I was wondering if you had any thoughts on perhaps Dedham's image as something pristine 
um, dare I open a can by using the word natural versus the reality that it's been heavily shaped by the human imagination. Um, we touched on this actually in the zine, uh, or James Green, a uh, long-time collaborator of ours, um, talked about rewilding and the presence of pingo ponds in, in the Brex, um, which is... Yeah, he makes a convincing argument, and I think while it's still valuable to be promoting nature in making it accessible to many, many people, as many people as possible, there is a fine line to be drawn where how yeah, how how natural can something be? How how natural can nature be if you're sculpting it like it's some sort of Victorian folly that everyone's just gathered around to take a look at. And but I mean I'm not I'm not to judge. I mean if, if I if I didn't live here then I wouldn't know about the less mainstream way, places to go and observe the beautiful nature. So, you know, if I was if I lived in Hull and I drove to East Anglia for a weekend, I'd probably go to the Dead and Vale to see some excellent woodland and or to, some excellent landscapes. Um, because I know they're there, but you know that person might not necessarily have the time or have done the research to go and uh, deep tourist, you know, rather than just you know. And how much of it is just tourism over, um, over people who who are local? Mm. Yeah, good points. Talking of deep touristing, actually, um, a term which I love, by the way. If someone was planning, let's say, a post-COVID break to these fine parts, um, are there any places you'd recommend they check out that they might not normally hear so much about? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, countless. Um, I think post-COVID is possibly getting a bit ahead of yourself there. But um, yeah, I mean, there are lots of places like Dunwich, for example. Dunwich is one of the most amazing places in the world, in my opinion. It used to be the biggest port in the UK. Uh, probably the biggest port in Europe, including Rome, which is mental. Um, and it fell in the sea, basically. All of it just fell into the sea through coastal erosion and um, various other events, cataclysmic events. Um, and now there's... And it, aside from it being one of the finest swimming beaches in the UK, it's not sand, but it's it's amazing for swimming. Um just up the road from it is the ruins of a mighty building um, and All Saints Church. And there's a thing called the Last Grave. And right on the edge of this little point of cliff where it's all fallen away is the last grave of that church. And that's, I mean, it's a striking image. Um, in general, I would, I would recommend cycling around East Anglia because you'll find the things that you're after. You all just like you'll just come across them because they're everywhere. Um, relics of the industrial era, um, mechanized agriculture. Um, if you're into that kind of 20th century stuff or 19th and 20th century stuff, it's museums on the 17th and 18th centuries. You know, they've got all the stuff about Matthew Hopkins in every town. There's a new um, kind of nugget of 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 interesting stuff to go around. And if that's your kind of thing, then I mean, this is the place to be, isn't it? pubs are amazing as well so <laughs> i think um the south south coast of suffolk all the way up to the north coast of norfolk if you were to drive that route you know you've got orford ness albra um in suffolk you've got all of these amazing places and then you get to places like waxham and horsey if you like nature um there's the one of the largest seal colonies in the uk is is in um, Horsey or Waxham Sands connecting to Horsey on the Norfolk coast. One of the best pubs in the world as well, the Nelson Head. Shout outs to the Nelson Head. Um, yeah, just basically I would just recommend coming here for the for the scenery, to be honest. like There's enough amazing stuff going on here to make it worthwhile coming. Um, especially if you've got a task in mind, like cycling. And thinking about the zine again, Rob, could you please introduce us to Sea Henge in case there is anyone unfamiliar with it? Yeah, Sea Henge is a a four thousand year old monument, um, megalithic. Uh, it's a slightly confusing term because it means stone, but it's not stone. But it's one of the few 
megalithic monuments that's not made of stone, basically, in the world. Um, and in nineteen, in the well, in the nineties, essentially, uh, Coma found a um, this upturned tree stump near Holm in uh, in Norfolk, um, on the coast, and it was surrounded by wooden posts in in the sea at low tide and then was covered by the sea at high tide um and he being a historical historically minded person um thought hang on wood circle stone circle there's something going on here um and yes as it turned out it was one of the most ancient monuments of wood ever found um and there was a huge furore uh, and a battle between the archaeologists who wanted to remove the henge in order to preserve it and put it into a museum uh, against the druids, essentially, who who saw this monument and continue to see this monument as um, a practising place of worship um, for, you know, various different denominations within the practice of druidism. Uh, druidism. Um so the conservationists, the druidic conservationists, wanted to leave it in situ in the sea um, and let it be, you know, treated reverently as a as a church might be or a mosque might be. Um, unfortunately, they didn't win. Uh, they did play the didgeridoo. They stood there in the middle of the sea, chained themselves to a log and played the didgeridoo. Um, and yet they lost, unfortunately. But good news is there is another stump kind of altar so the stump I, I should add it, it was upturned that was why it was interesting because the stump had clearly been physically and manually put there by a human being and then surrounded by posts because the posts themselves are quite crumbled i mean they're over three thousand nine hundred years old i mean they're going to show a bit of wear but um yeah so the original sea henge was removed and then they found another um henge a few miles south i think i'm conscious of the time but i know this is only your first issue but could you tell us what does the future of black dog zine look like to you uh, yeah it's it's looking really fun it's we've got um the our next issue um will if all goes to plan of course um be released in october um and we've got a lot of interesting um, stuff to do with that. I'm not sure. We haven't told uh, anyone about the content of the zine apart from creators at the moment. So you're gonna have to. I'm gonna have to leave you in the dark on that one for now. Yes, keep it under the hat. Um, but yeah, there's lots coming up. Like you know, we've got loads of great contributors this time. Uh, I mean, not that we didn't last time, but we've got loads more. Loads. It was amazing to see how people got in touch and had so much to say uh, that they thought they'd love to put in a, a publication like Black Dog, which I fully wasn't expecting. I was expecting it to be a kind of very low key. We wouldn't sell most of them. Whereas it turns out we literally, we put them up for sale. They were gone in a week. We did another run. They were gone in a week. You know, it's, it's pretty crazy. People are really into it. And so we've had greater access to, um, to content than we ever had before from a variety of different sources. So I'm really excited for the next one. The next one's going to be big. Uh, it's going to be a bit bigger. There's going to be a bit more artist collaboration. The aesthetics will be slightly different and self-containing. It's going to be really cool. And then aside from that, we've got lots of ephemeral projects kind of on the go. You know, there's potential for, a, you know, musical release. Um, there's potential for uh, various uh, products tactile tangible things that you can hold in your hand uh, that hopefully will have symbolic and cultural significance to people that's the plan much like listening to a, a, a vinyl record um, I think adding back that kind of tangible non-transient form of consuming media that forces you to sort of buy a physical product and then have that tactile interaction with it um, I think it's a much more satisfying experience. And I mean, that's talking about it from like a product level, but like um, rather than reading off a screen, I'd rather read from a book, especially if it looks really nice and it comes with a couple of stickers kind of thing. Um, and, you know, there's a big, there's a strong culture of, of doing it in the UK. There always has been. Back in the 70s, 
uh, all the way from nineteen the the forties, for example, there was a there was a zine in uh, has has been an East Anglian magazine uh, concerning esoteric science and um, underground culture, um, UFO sightings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I think carrying on in that tradition is a good thing to do. We've also got a big wheelbarrow full of dirt that we harvested on the Blood Moon, which we're going to send to some people as well. <laughs> Oh, Rob, thank you so much, and I shall be patiently waiting for my bag of dirt. You're too kind. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us on your wonderful programme. A huge thank you there to Rob Jones of Black Dog Zine for sitting down and knocking about some ideas on this region. Once again, please head to blackdogzine.co.uk to grab a copy, and you can follow the lads on Instagram at blackdogzine where they post all sorts of eyeball-pleasing stuff. And just to say, at the beginning of this episode, I read a rather evocative poem from issue one of Black Dog Zine itself, The Land Ritual, which is another reason to bag yourselves a copy. So please enjoy the last days of this crazy year's waning summer. And we've got an excerpt of Martin Newell's epic Black Shuck poem to see us out. Till next time. From these misty marshes, the sucking, popping marshes, the dog jumps up and soundlessly goes by to parish, copse and crossroad, through churchyard lane and field, then you or someone close to you may die. And Shuck, the hound of Odin, the black dog of the fens, who pads across the shadows of the years, will spring out on the traveller with burning ember eyes, to haunt the ancient roads where he appears. And as the daylight's fading, when Lammas has come in, and gleaners go to work among the stubble, there comes an autumn sickle to cut the summer's throat, before the season knows it is in trouble. And I stop by a gateway to smoke a cigarette, and stare across the fields and remember the gypsy fairs of August and early evening haze, the dirty golden mustard of September. Then Shuck will run behind me and I may not look back, but press on into darkness as I must, as others have before me and others yet to come, who flower once before they turn to dust. Now here the dog comes running, he clears a broken wall and disappears behind the shattered stones to court the spinster spirits of long dead country maids beside the mossy graves and cedar cones. And where they are all sleeping, the dog lies panting down, the fire of forests burning in his eyes, whilst darkly in the churchyard, The silence sets around, and time itself dissolves within his guise. And then his head came off, unfortunately. Unlucky break.